against him. Good morning, everyone. Well, today is Teacher Appreciation Sunday, and to me it's a very important day because I get the opportunity to say thank you to some really, really wonderful Sunday school teachers. And it's an opportunity for us to say thank you as well. You know, it always amazes me every year who God calls to come and teach our children. Really, this church is very blessed. So every time I walk through this church, I'm really struck by the magnificence of the stained glass windows. And during the day, they're just incredibly bright, and they teach us, they help us to really know God and to understand God. And they really are tools for teaching. But not so much when the sun's not shining. I've been privileged to work with some really super Sunday school teachers, and I've witnessed them sharing their light to, with our children and helping them to understand what God wants them to know through all the Bible stories that we've touched upon this year. They have been the light of God for each child that has come to us to learn about God and God's love. So teachers, when your name is called, please come forward and receive a little gift from this church inside the little box that my Abby is holding, the little bag, is a flashlight to remind you that you have been the light for our children. And I thank you so much. Sonia and Kent Hardwick. Gretchen and Errol Ure, I don't believe are here today and neither is Renee. I think she had a real busy weekend with the boys. Betty Reese. <laughs> uh, Jessica Pratt. <laughs> and Carol Nielsen. Thank you all for sharing your light with our children. And I'd love to take my kids. We're going to learn what it means to be fishers of men.
morning. In the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. In the presence of the Lord. The hymn is number 43, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Hymn number 43. Please join me in the invocation as we pray together. O oh God, today we seek hope from you to share with the hopeless. We seek love from you to share with the unloved and abused. We seek peace from you to live well the journey of life. These things we pray in the name of our Lord, 
who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> Beloved, to those who seek good things from God to share with others, God provides what is sought. Thanks be to God. Today's responsive reading is from Job 38, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. On what were its bases sunk? Where were you when the morning stars sang together and all heaven shouted for joy? Who shut the sea in with doors when it burst out from the moon? Where were you when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its band? Where were you when I prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors? Where were you when I said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and here shall you, your proud waves be stopped? Where were you? Where were you? Who is this that darkens counsel without knowledge? Amen. Sandy for that. That's an appropriate introduction to our celebration of baptism this morning for the Wiest family. Jacob Ryan and Brinley Quinn are going to come in just a moment and be welcomed into the family of God. But a little bit about this family before they come. Mom and Dad were married here in 2011, Ryan and Lisa, and Zachary, the older brother, was baptized here in 2015. So yet again, we find that this is a family for whom this church is a part of the important events in their life. When they want to do something that is meaningful in the life of faith, 
this seems to be the place to which they come. Now Brian is one of those guys that you might look at him and ask, would you buy a used car from this guy? Because that's the business he's in. He, he and his dad own a previously owned car lot in Maple Shade, and Lisa is a speech therapist helping young children learn how to speak well and helping older stroke victims learn how to recover their speech. Both are invested in the lives of other people as they will be invested in these two young lives with which God has entrusted them. So Jacob and Brindley, let me invite you to come now and bring your parents to receive God's gift of baptism. Jacob, Renly, these are the waters of baptism that welcome you today. They are a sign of your entrance into the community of faith, into the kingdom of God, to be a part of the family of God. We want you to know that as we baptize you today, we promise to you to be a safe place where you can come and explore your faith and explore the things of God and learn the things of God. We hope that it will be your story as it was the story of our Savior Jesus, that you will grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and others. I want to ask now that those who are with the Weiss family, if you would stand, because you represent a very important part of this journey. Some are grandparents, some are just friends, some may be aunts and uncles, but they are essential to the growth of you too. They will help to make sure that you grow in knowledge and in faith. They will in fact represent that village that it takes to raise a child. I also want to ask that the members of Protestant Community Church stand at this time. And I want Jacob and Brindley to see that all of these are standing in your support. All of them promise to be a part of your growth and your development. All of them promise to be for you what they can in terms of your being able to grow in God. I'll invite all of you now to be seated. Jacob Ryan Weiss, because of the support that you have, because of your family's desire, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And Brindley Quinn Weiss, because of the support of your family and those here, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May the goodness of God fill you. May the grace of God always be with you. May the wisdom of God guide you as you grow in life according to God. Amen. The hymn is number 347, Be Still My Soul. Hymn number 347.
Today's gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great gale arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Some years ago, Sebastian Younger wrote a book entitled The Perfect Storm. The book was about the sinking of the Andrea Gale, a terrible sinking of a fishing vessel in which no one survived. As Hollywood is wont to do, they took Younger's book and made a movie out of it. Now it became more of a historical fiction than an actual truth as things often do when they are made into movies. But I can remember watching the movie after it came to VCR or DVD or whatever we were watching at the time, and I remember my abiding impression of the movie being that the way that storm was portrayed, by the time that movie was over, I thought I was going to drown. That's how real it was. That's how devastating that storm was portrayed. And that is no doubt how the disciples of Jesus must have felt in today's New Testament lesson. As they set out on the sea, they no doubt felt that life was about to come to a tragic end. They no doubt felt that somehow they wouldn't survive this storm. They no doubt felt like they were about to drown while their master was asleep in the helm of the boat. I think this story tells us some things about the storms of our lives. And I think it tells us some things about surviving the storms of our lives. And I want to suggest to you that at least the following seems to be a part of the story. It seems to me that the storm represents the unexpected things that invade every life. You do recognize that with storms in life, it's not a question of if. It is a question of when. Everybody will face storms in life. The question is, how will we respond to them? The question is, what will our reaction be? The question is, will the storm strengthen us or will it defeat us? Because into every life, these unexpected things come and invade the life that we enjoy living and we are faced with what to do with them, just as these disciples were faced with that question as they tried to make their way across the Sea of Galilee on that day. I think we also learn from this story that people react differently to the presence of life storms. People react differently as these disruptions invade their day-to-day living. Now the disciples' fear was that they had set out for a three-hour cruise and were about to be in full Gilligan's Island mode, and they were about to be stranded in a place they did not want to be stranded. They were about to find themselves in conditions that were not favorable for their future. Jesus 
acknowledging the difficulty, had a different response. His response was to speak a word of peace in the midst of the storm. To say to the storm, peace be still. In all of our lives, there's a range of possibilities between the reaction of those disciples and the reaction of Jesus that we all engage in as the storms of life invade our own journeys. Some of us, like the disciples, are certain that there's no way that we will ever survive. And others of us, like Jesus, are able to find some peace in the midst of the storm. We're able to find a way to survive even in the midst of the difficulty. The truth in surviving the storms of life is that we will all respond to those storms quite differently. And I don't know that there's a good way or a bad way to respond. I just know that we're going to respond according to who we are, to how we feel, and to what the storm seems to be doing to our day-to-day living. I think this story is also here to remind us that while God does not promise that we can avoid the storm, God does promise that there will always be someone there with us in the midst of the storm. If you look at Scripture, that's a thread that seems to run all the way through it. Even from that story of Job we read this morning, Job in all of his misery did not find himself alone. Now granted, his friends and his wife weren't a lot of help, and sometimes what they suggested were things that he might not want to do, but they were always there with him, and God was there with him. When we read the story about Elijah, who thinks that he is alone in doing God's work, we are reminded that God comes to him in the still of the storm and says to him, Elijah, you are not alone. There are at least 700 others who are holding up the faith just as you are. And we are reminded in this story of a storm that these disciples, though they think they are alone and about to face their sudden demise, are not alone at all, for their master is there with them, and he will speak a word to the storm that will bring the calm that they desire. This story, if it reminds us of nothing else, it reminds us that when we face the storms of life, we never do so alone, unless we choose to. Now, we can ignore the help that is around us. We can ignore the people who would want to help strengthen us, We can ignore the experience of others and decide that we will do it alone, but we don't have to. We always have others around us and with us who can help us negotiate the storms of life. Storms are going to come. Storms are going to be difficult. Storms are going to have to be endured. And if we're going to survive the storms of life, I think we need to glean from this story at least these three things about surviving the storms of life. The first is that no matter how difficult the storm becomes, you are never really alone. There is always someone there on whom you can call for help. There is always the possibility of support and learning from someone else how to negotiate the storms of life. And there is always the power of faith and God and the community that we call the church. And if we're going to survive the storms of life, we also have to know that even if the worst happens, even if the boat sinks, And sometimes it does. The message of Jesus still remains. Even in the midst of the worst scenario, we can still say, peace, be still. 
Because after a time, the phoenix will rise, our life will be gathered back together from the ashes just as Job's was, and we will be able to live again as God intended. Scarred by the storm, yes, but not destroyed by it. Peace, be still, is always the message. And if we're going to survive the storms of life, I think we have to recognize that the endurance for living comes from negotiating the difficulties with which we are faced in life. We gain confidence for living by going through the sorts of storms that these disciples were faced with in this story. Think about the people that you most admire. Think about the people that you think really have it together. Those people to whom you look, for example, those people to whom you look and know with confidence that they know how to live life. Do you know how they got there? They got there by surviving storms. They got there by enduring the difficulties that life threw at them. They got there by joining their lives with other lives so that when the storms came, they would not be overwhelmed, but they would eventually be strengthened. What this story tells me, and what I hope this story tells you, is that the storm is inevitable. But survival, and in fact thriving on the other side of the storm, is also possible. May God give us the grace to recognize the storms of life will come. And may God give us the courage to speak a word of peace in the midst of the storm, knowing that as we endure the storm, we will be stronger on the other side and better able to live life and serve others. Amen. We're going to receive an offering at this time. May God bless the gifts that you've brought to give this day. Um.